Chapter 9 of Strange Pages from Family Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strange Pages from Family Papers by T. F. Thistleton Dyer. Chapter 9 Devil Compacts. Mephistopheles, I will bind myself to your service here and never sleep nor slumber at your call. When we meet on the other side, you shall do as much for me. Goethe's Faust The well-known story of Faust reminds us of the many similar weird tales which have long held a prominent place in family traditions. But in the majority of cases the devil is cheated out of his bargain by some spell against which his influence is powerless. According to the popular notion, compacts are frequently made with the devil, by which he is bound to complete, for instance, a building, as a house, a church, a bridge, or the like, within a certain period. But through some artifice, by which the soul of the person for whom he is doing the work is saved, the completion of the undertaking is prevented. Thus the cock is made to crow, because, like all spirits that shun the light of the sun, the devil loses his power at break of day. The idea of bartering the soul for temporary gain has not been confined to any country but as an article of terrible superstition has been widespread. Mr. Lecky has pointed out how, in the fourteenth century, the bar-reliefs on cathedrals frequently represent men kneeling down before the devil, and devoting themselves to him as his servants. In our own country such compacts were generally made at midnight in some lowly churchyard, or amid the ruins of some castle. But fortunately for mankind, by resorting to spells and counter-spells, the binding effects of these devil bonds, as they have been termed, were, in most cases, rendered ineffectual, the devil thereby losing the advantage. It is noteworthy that the wisdom of the serpent is frequently outwitted by a crafty woman, or a cunning priest. A well-known Lancashire tradition gives a humorous account of how the devil was on one occasion deluded by the shrewdness of a clever woman. Barely three miles from Clitheroe, on the high road to Gisburn, stood a public house with this title, The Duel Upon Dun, which means, The Devil Upon Dun Horse. The story runs that a poor tailor sold himself to Satan for seven years, on his granting him certain wishes, after which term, according to the contract, signed as is customary with the victim's own blood, his soul was to become the devil's own. When the fatal day arrived, on the advice of his wife, he consulted the Holy Father at Shelley in his extremity, at last the hour came which the evil one claimed his victim, who trembly contended that the contract was won from him by fraud and dishonest pretenses, and had not been fulfilled. He even ventured to hint at his lack of power to bestow riches, or any great gift, on which Satan was goaded into granting him another wish. Then, said the trembling tailor, I wish thou wert riding back again to thy quarters on yonder dun horse, and never able to plague me again or any other poor wretch whom thou hast gotten into thy clutches. The words were no sooner uttered than the devil, with a roar which was heard as far as calm, went away riveted to the back of this dun horse, the tailor watching his departure almost beside himself for joy. He lived for many years in health and affluence, and, at his death, one of his relatives, having brought the house where he resided, turned it into an inn, having for his sign the doll upon dun. On it was depicted Old Horny, mounted on a scraggy dun horse, without saddle or bridle, the terrified steed being off and away at full gallop from the door, while a small, hilarious tailor with shears and measures viewed his departure with anything but grief or disapprobation. The authors of Lancashire Legends, describing this old house, inform us that it was one of those ancient gabled black-and-white edifices, now fast disappearing under the march of improvement. Many windows of little lozenge-shaped panes set in lead, might be seen here in all various stages of renovation and decay. Over the door, till lately, swung the old and quaint sign, attesting the truth of the tradition. Occasionally similar bargains have been rendered ineffectual by cunning device. In the north wall of the church of Trimurchian, North Wales, has long been shown the tomb of a former vicar, who was also celebrated as a necromancer, flourishing in the middle of the 14th century. It is reported that he proved himself more clever than the wicked one himself. A bargain was made between them that the vicar should practice the black art with impunity during his life, but that the devil should possess his body after death, 
whether he were buried within or without the church. But the worthy vicar dexterously cheated his ally of his bargain by being buried within the church wall itself. A similar tradition is told of other localities, and amongst them of Barn Hall, in the parish of Tolleson Knights, on the border of the Essex Marshes. In the middle of a field is shown an enclosed, uncultivated spot where, the legend says, it was originally intended to erect the hall, had not the devil come by night and destroyed the work of the day. This kind of thing went on for some time, when it was arranged that a knight, attended by two dogs, should watch for the author of this mischief. He had not long to wait, for, in the quiet of the night, the Prince of Darkness made his appearance, bent on his mischievous errand. A tussle ensued, in the course of which, snatching up a beam from the building, he hurled it to the site of the present hall, exclaiming, Wheresoe'er this beam shall fall, there shall stand Barn Hall. But the devil, very angry at being thus foiled by the knight, vowed that he would have him at his death whether he was buried in the church or out of it. But this doom was averted by burying him in the wall, half in and half out of the church. At Brent Pelham Church Hearts, too, there is a tomb of one Pierre Shonks, and there is a tale current in the neighbourhood that the devil swore he would have him, no matter whether buried within or without the church. So, as a means of escape, he was built up in the wall of the sacred edifice. Another extraordinary story has long been told of Hermitage Castle, one of the most famous of the border keeps in the days of its splendour. It's not surprising, therefore, that for many years past it has had the reputation of being haunted, having been described as... Haunted hermitage, where long by spells mysterious bound, they pace their round with lifeless smile, and shake with restless foot the guilty pile, till sink the smouldering towers beneath the burdened ground. It is popularly said that Lord Sulis the evil hero of Hermitage, in an unguarded moment, made a compact with the devil, who appeared to him in the shape of a spirit wearing a red cap, which gained its hue from the blood of human victims, in which it was steeped. Lord Sulis sold himself to the devil, and in return he was permitted to summon his familiar, whenever he was desirous of doing so, by rapping thrice on an iron chest, the condition being that he never looked in the direction of the spirit. But one day, whether wittingly or not has never been ascertained, he failed to comply with this stipulation, and his doom was sealed. But even then the foul fiend kept the letter of the compact. Lord Sulis was protected by an unholy charm against any injury from rope or steel. Hence cords could not bind him, and steel could not slay him. But when at last he was delivered over to his enemies, it was found necessary to adopt the ingenious and effective expedient of rolling him up in a sheet of lead and boiling him to death. And so... On a circle of stones they placed the pot, on a circle of stones but barely nine. They heated it red and fiery hot, and the burnished brass did glimmer and shine. They rolled him up in a sheet of lead, a sheet of lead for a funeral pall. They plunged him into the cauldron red, and melted him, body, lead, bones and all. This was the terrible end of the body of Lord Sulis but his spirit is supposed to still linger on the scene, and once every seven years he keeps tryst with Red Cap on the scene of his former devilries. And still, when seven years are o'er, is heard the jarring sound when hollow opes the charmed door of chamber underground. A tradition well known in Yorkshire relates how on the Eagle's Crag, otherwise named the Witch's Horse Block, the Lady of Burnshaw Tower made that strange compact with the devil, whereby she not only became mistress of the country around, but the dreaded queen of the Lancashire witches. It seems that this Lady Sybil was possessed of almost unrivalled beauty, and scarcely a day passed without some fresh admirer seeking her hand, an additional attraction being her great wealth. Her intellectual attainments, too, were commonly said to be far beyond those of her sex, and oftentimes she would visit the Eagle's Crag in order to study nature and admire the varied aspects of the surrounding country. It was on these occasions that Lady Sybil often felt a desire to possess supernatural powers, and, in an unwary moment, it is said that she was induced to sell her soul to the devil, in order that she might be able to take a part in the nightly revelries of the then famous Lancashire witches. It is added that the bond was duly attested with her blood, and that, in consequence of this compact, 
her utmost wishes were at all times granted. Hapton Tower was at this time occupied by a junior branch of the Townerly family, and although Lord William had long been a suitor for the hand of Lady Sybil, his proposals were constantly rejected. In his despair he determined to consult a famous Lancashire witch, one mother Helston, who promised him success on the ensuing All Hallows' Eve. When the day arrived, in accordance with her directions, he went out hunting, and on nearing Eagle's Crag he startled a milk-white doe. But after scouring the country for miles, the hounds being well-nigh exhausted, he returned to the crag. At this crisis a strange hound joined them, the familiar of Mother Helston, which had been sent to catch Lady Sybil, who had assumed the disguise of the white doe. The remainder of the curious family legend, as told by Mr. Harland, is briefly this. During the night Hapton Tower was shaken as by an earthquake, and in the morning the captured doe appeared as the fair heiress of Burnshaw. Counterspells were adopted, her powers of witchcraft were suspended, and before many days had passed, Lord William had the happiness to lead his newly wedded bride to his ancestral home. But within a year she had renewed her diabolical practices, causing a serious breach between her husband and herself. Happily a reconciliation was eventually effected, but her bodily strength gave way, and her health rapidly declined. When it became evident that the hour of her death was drawing near, Lord William obtained the services of the neighbouring clergy, and by their holy offices the devil's bond was cancelled. Soon afterwards Lady Sybil died in peace, but Burnshaw Tower was from that time deserted. Popular tradition, however, still alleges that her grave was dug where the dark eagle's crag shoots out its cold bare peak into the sky, and on the eve of all hallows the hound and the milk-white doe are supposed by the peasantry to meet on the crag, pursued by a spectre huntsman in full chase. It is further added that the belated peasant crosses himself at the sound, remembering the sad fate of Lady Sybil of Burnshaw Tower. It is curious to find no less a person than Sir Francis Drake charged with having been befriended by the devil, and the many marvellous stories current respecting him still linger among the Devonshire peasantry. By the aid of the devil, it is said, he was enabled to destroy the Spanish Armada, and his connection with the old Abbey of Buckland is equally singular. An extensive building attached to the abbey, for instance, which was no doubt used as barns and stables after the place had been deprived of its religious character, was reported to have been built by the devil in three nights. After the first night, writes Mr. Hunt, the butler, astonished at the work done, resolved to watch and see how it was performed. Consequently, on the second night, he mounted into a large tree and hid himself between the forks of its five branches. At midnight, so the story goes, the devil came, riding teams of oxen, and as some of them were lazy, he plucked this tree from the ground and used it as a goad. The poor butler lost his senses, and never recovered them. Although, as it has been truly remarked, On the waters that washed the shores of the county of Devon were achieved many of those triumphs which make Sir Francis Drake's life read more like a romance than a sober chronicle of facts. The extraordinary traditions told respecting him have largely invested his life with the supernatural, but, whatever may have been the nature of his dealings with the devil, we are told that he has had to pay dearly for any earthly advantages he may have derived therefrom in his lifetime. Being forced to drive at night a black hearse, drawn by headless horses and urged on by running devils and yelping headless dogs, along the road from Tavistock to Plymouth, among the many tales related in which the demoniacal element holds a prominent place, there is one relating to the projected marriage of his wife. It seems that Sir Francis was abroad, and his wife, not hearing from him for seven years, concluded he must be dead, and hence was at liberty to enter for a second time the holy estate of matrimony. Her choice was made, and the nuptial day fixed. But Sir Francis Drake was informed of all this by a spirit that attended him, and just as the wedding was about to be solemnized, he hastily charged one of his big guns and discharged a ball. So true was the aim that the ball shot up right through the globe, dashed through the roof of the church, and fell with a loud explosion between the lady and her intended bridegroom. The spectators and assembled guests were thrown into the wildest confusion, but the bride declared it was an indication that Sir Francis Drake was still alive, and, as she refused to allow another golden circlet to be placed on her finger, the intended ceremony was, in the most abrupt and unexpected manner, ended. The prettiest part of the tale remains to be told, 
Not long afterwards, Sir Francis Drake returned, and, disguised as a beggar, he solicited alms from his wife at her own door. When, unable to prevent smiling in the midst of a feigned tale of abject poverty, she recognised him, and a very joyful meeting took place. And even Buckland Abbey did not escape certain strange influences. Some years ago, a small box was found in a closet, which had been long closed, containing, it is supposed, family papers. It was arranged that this box should be sent to the residence of the inheritor of the property. The carriage was at the abbey door, into which it was easily lifted. The owner having taken his seat, the coachman attempted to start his horses, but in vain. They would not, they could not, move. More horses were brought, and then the heavy farm horses, and eventually all the oxen. They were powerless to start the carriage. At length a mysterious voice was heard, declaring that the box could never be moved from Buckland Abbey. Accordingly, it was taken from the carriage easily by one man, and a pair of horses galloped off with the carriage. The famous Jewish banker, Samuel Bernard, who died in the year 1789, leaving an enormous property, had, it is said, a favourite black cock which was regarded by many as uncanny, and as unpleasantly connected with the amassing of his fortune. The bird died a day or two before his master. It would seem that in bygone years black cocks were extensively used in magical incantations and in sacrifices to the devil, and Burns, it may be remembered, in his Address to the Deal, says, Some cock or cat your rage must stop. And a well-known French recipe for invoking the evil one runs thus. Take a black cock under your left arm, and go at midnight to where four crossroads meet. Then cry three times, Poule noir or else utter Robert nine times, and the devil will appear. Among the romantic stories told of Kersal Hall, Lancashire, it is related how Eustace Dauncey, one of its chiefs in days of old, wooed a maiden fair with a handsome fortune, but she gave her heart to a rival suitor. The wedding day was fixed, but the prospect of her marriage was a terrible trouble to Eustace, and threatened to mar the happiness of his life. Having, however, in his youth perfected himself in the black art, he drew a magic circle at the witching hour of night, and summoned the evil one to a consultation. The meeting came off, at which the usual bargain was quickly struck, the soul of Eustace being bartered for the coveted body of the beautiful young lady. The compact it was arranged should close at her death, but the evil one was to remain meanwhile by the side of Dauncey in the form of an elegant self or genteel companion. In due course the eventful day arrived when Eustace stood before the altar, but the marriage ceremony was no sooner over than on leaving the sacred edifice the elements were found to be the reverse of favourable to them. The flowers strewed before their feet stuck to their wet shoes, and soaking rain cast a highly depressing influence on all the bridal surroundings, and on arriving at the festive hall where the marriage feast was to be held, the ill fortune of Eustace assumed another shape. Strange to say, his bride began to melt away before his very eyes, and thoroughly familiar as he was with the laws of magic, here was a new phase of mystery which was completely beyond his comprehension. In short, poor Eustace was the wretched victim of a complete swindle, for while on the one hand something is recorded about a holy prayer, a sunny beam, and an angel train bearing the fair maiden slowly to a fleecy cloud in whose bosom she became lost to earth, Dauncey, on the other hand, awakened to consciousness by a touch from his sinister companion, saw a huge yawning gulf at his feet, and felt himself gradually sinking in a direction exactly the opposite of that taken by his bride, who in the short space of an hour was lost to him for ever. But one of the most curious cases of this kind was that recorded in an old tractate, published in 1662, giving an account attested by six of the sufficientest men of the town of what happened to a certain John Leach, a farmer living at Raveley. Being desirous of visiting Whittlesea Fair, he went beforehand with a neighbour to an inn for the purpose of drinking his morning's draught. Whilst the two were enjoying their morning's draught, Mr. Leach began to be very merry, and seeing his friend was desirous of going, he exclaimed, Let the devil take him, who goeth out of this house to-day. But in his merriment, he forgot his rash observation, and shortly afterwards, calling for his horse, set out for the fair. He had not travelled far on the road, when he remembered what he had said, his conscience being sure troubled at that damnable oath which he had took. Not knowing what to do, he rode about, first one way and then another, until darkness set in, and at about two o'clock in the night, 
he espied two grim creatures before him in the likeness of griffins. These were the devil's messengers, who had been sent to take him at his word, and take him they did, according to the testimony of the six sufficientest men of the town. They roughly handled him, took him up in the air, stripped him, and then dropped him, a sad spectacle, all bloody and gored, in a farmyard just outside the town of Doddington. Here he was discovered, lying upon some harrows, in the condition described. He was picked up and carried to a gentleman's house, where, being well cared for, he narrated the remarkable adventure which had befallen him. Before long, however, he grew into a frenzy so desperate that they were afraid to stay in his chamber, and the gentleman of the house, not knowing what to do, sent for the parson of the town. Prompted, it is supposed, by the satanic influence which still held him, Mr. Leach rushed at the minister, and attacked him with so much fury, that it was like to have cost him his life. But the noise being heard below, the servants rushed up, rescued the parson, and tied Mr. Leach down in his bed, and left him. The next morning, hearing nothing, they thought he was asleep, but on entering his room, he was discovered with his neck broke, his tongue out of his mouth, and his body as black as a shoe, all swelled, and every bone in his body out of joint. We may conclude these extraordinary cases of devil bonds, with two further strange incidents, one an apparent record of a case of a similar kind, which was practised amidst the frivolities and plotting of the French court by no less celebrated a lady than Catherine de' Medici. In the secret history of France for the last century, this incredible story is given. In the First Civil War, when the Prince of Conde was, in all appearance, likely to prevail, and Catherine was thought to be very near the end of her much-desired regency, during the young king's minority, she was known to have been for two days together, retired to her closet, without admitting her menial servants to her presence. Some few days after, having called for Monsieur de Mem, one of the long robe, and always firm to her interest, she delivered him a steel box, fast locked, to whom she said, giving him the key, that in respect she knew not what might come to her by fortune, amidst those intestine broils that then shook France, she had thought fit to enclose a thing of great value within that box, which she consigned to his care, not to open it upon oath, but by an express order under her own hand. The Queen dying without ever calling for the box, it continued many years unopened in the family of de Mem, after both their deaths, till, at last, curiosity, or the suspicion of some treasure, from the heaviness of it, tempted Monsieur de Mem's successor to break it open, which he did, instead of any rich present from so great a queen. What horror must the lookers-on have when they found a copper plate of the form and bigness of one of the ancient Roman votive shields, on which was engraved Queen Catherine de Medici on her knees, in a praying posture, offering up to the devil sitting upon a throne, in one of the ugliest shapes they used to paint him. Charles the Ninth, then reigning, the Duke of Anjou, afterwards Henry the Third, and the Duke of Alençon, her three sons, with this motto in French, So be it, I but reign. And in the court rolls of the manor of Hatfield, near the Isle of Axholm, Yorkshire, the following ridiculous story is given. Robert de Roderham appeared against John de Ithon, for that he had not kept the agreement made between them, and therefore complains that on a certain day and year, at Thorn, there was an agreement between the aforesaid Robert and John, whereby the said John sold to the said Robert, the devil, bound in a certain bond for three pence farthing, and thereupon the said Robert delivered to the said John one farthing as earnest money, by which the property of the said devil was vested in the person of the said Robert, to have livery of the said devil on the fourth day, next following, at which day the said Robert came to the forenamed John and asked delivery of the said devil, according to the agreement between them made. But the said John refused to deliver the said devil, nor has he yet done it, etc., to the great damage of the said Robert, to the amount of sixty guineas, and he has, therefore, brought his suit. The said John came, and did not deny the said agreement and because it appeared to the court that such a suit ought not to subsist among Christians, the aforesaid parties are, therefore, adjourned to the infernal regions, there to hear their judgment, and both parties were immersed by William de Scargell, Seneschal. End of chapter 9